So a very warm welcome to this special Q&A session. Um, we're really delighted to welcome back Graham Music. Um, as many of you will know, Graham uh, delivered our first live training session back in March on trauma and the um, adaptive brain. Lots of you were able to join us for that. Um, but for those of you who weren't, we wanted to uh, invite Graham back to uh, answer some of your questions and also to do a deeper dive really into Graham's uh, expertise. So thank you very much indeed for coming back to share some more of your brain with us, Graham, this morning. Um, and as I'm sure lots of you will know, we've also joined here by Becky Hill. Becky is Clear Sky's Head of Therapeutic uh, Thinking. Um, Becky's very kindly collated the questions uh, from us for Graham today and has also kindly agreed to lead us through those questions. So we have about 40 minutes, I think. So we will try and answer as many or put as many questions to Graham as we can. Hopefully he'll answer them, um, yeah, as many of them as he's able to in the time. But uh, without further ado, I will stop waffling and hand you over to Becky. So thank you, Becky. Anna. Amazing. So yeah, Graham, thank you so much for being here with us. To start, we'd really love to just learn a little bit about you and your work and your experience. Okay. Um, yeah. So you got my name and I am I trained a long, long time ago as, a, well, I've done many things in my life, but um, I trained quite a long time ago as an adult humanistic integrative psychotherapist. And then I did some of the Tavistock trainings to become an child and adolescent psychotherapist and before that I did other trainings like some art therapy and before that I bought and sold antiques and before and I think everything I've done in my life has um, in a way informed how I work and I know that mainly your um, play lot, there's an awful lot of play therapists in the audience and I've got immense respect for that kind of work and my first ever work was working with a, a, a strange old woman called Rachel Pinney who's about 82 at the time, and she worked from her council flat. And she had a play therapy center. And she wrote a brilliant book about play therapy, almost as good as Dibs, not as well written, and never, no one ever found it. And we would just turn up and she would present kids to us. And we were, had to have a lot of training. And we just had to do non-directed play therapy. And I can honestly say, I think I almost learned more from that than anything else I did later on. Later on. It's a completely fascinating experience. None of it would be allowed today because there's no such thing as a CRB test or <laughs> you could just go and take it off. Goodness knows. But it, but anyway, I, I think name, in terms Graham, of sorry? Rachel Pinney, P-I-N-N-E-Y. And it was an organisation called Children's Hours Trust. And it was actually influenced quite a lot by a woman called Margaret Lowenfeld, who's one of the leaders in the early days of child psychotherapy. So, um, but, 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 but since those times, I suppose I've always worked with children and young people. And then I I had a always, always worked since then with adults in, in private practice. And nearly all my work has been around trauma, abuse, and neglect and in those sorts of areas. And my passion has been linking neuroscience, attachment theory, developmental science ideas, evolutionary thinking with core pucker, psychotherapeutic, psychoanalytic and other kinds of ideas and trying to make my own integration and find my own way. And I think this links into play. So, um, because actually I think if you can't be yourself, you can't do this work and you have to find yourself in this work in order to be any good at it and do any good at it I would yeah. say. Amazing thank you so really pleased you've brought us into play um we'd really like to chat to you a lot further about that and as you say we've got lots of play therapists and other creative arts therapists in the audience so um can you tell us a bit about why you feel play is so important in the therapeutic relationship and in psychotherapy and how you think it supports the relationship dynamic itself. Okay, so in a way it's a kind of, it, it, it's a kind of double direction, bi-directional, um, bi-directional journey of mutual influence. So as a start, you can't play unless you feel safe. You can't play unless you feel at ease. You can't play unless you feel trust. And so all those things are the kind of sine qua non, they're the absolute basics of any therapeutic work. So without safeness, you can't, it's a bit like saying, relax, you know, you can't, it doesn't work. Play. Mm -hmm. you know? I've heard parents say that, you go off and play, you know, actually, I want a bit of attention. <laughs> but it's, yeah. so without those sorts of things, play doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. But actually, in order to be able to play, you requ it requires a range, a whole tranche of developmental capacities that only come from having had good experiences before. 
So those, and they may, may have started, well, they may even have started in utero actually, but it certainly would have started almost immediately postnatally. And that would have been the capacity to be, you know, to have been held in mind, to be thought about, to be attuned with, to be empathized with. So all of those things, A, they create relaxation, B, they create this capacity to be in touch with thoughts and feelings. They create a, a non-wary, non-hypervigilant capacity to understand other people and how they think and feel and how they understand you. And interestingly, you can't play without those capacities. And so the roots of play and good play Becky, tell me any time I veer off the question, because I will. So one of the, one of, one of the, one of the um, radio programs I always like is, is it any question where you, you're supposed to walk, talk for five minutes without stopping? Just stop me. So, um... <laughs> actually, just to say, I'm, I'm actually just enjoying taking this in because I think we're, we've got a question about the challenges with sharing this style of work with schools and actually listening to everything that you're saying is just really confirming. So I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Keep going. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, in a way, the roots of play, I mean, the roots of play, not, I'm not thinking about it in the evolutionary terms, but we can come back to that if that's of interest. But the roots of play in humans are a bit different to other animals, but again, in some ways similar. But it's, it, it's that play and playfulness depend on that capacity to, um, to have reciprocity with another human being. And that requires being able to read their thoughts and feelings and intentions and be interested in them and be curious and, and have a kind of lightness of touch. And that comes from being loved and adored, I think, more than anything. Mm -hmm. And it comes from being somebody being interested in you and curious about you. And it comes from, so I can't play. If you ask me, let's play, I was going to say doctors and nurses, but I can't say that. Uh, but let, let's say, um, I would say we were going to play a, game, a make believe game of some kind. Um, like shops, it's often the first game. Of I play that yeah. with my niece every weekend. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I I can't play with you unless I know that I, that you're going to play the game, which means that I can read what you're thinking, you can read what I'm thinking, and I can put yourself in your shoes. Mm. And and putting myself in somebody's shoes, it requires a degree of empathy, and it requires an ability to have enough internal freedom, if you like, to be able to move from great music in a kind of rigid way to, oh yeah, I can be this. Mm. So I, have an, I, I need to have enough sort of sense of confidence and ease in my own being in order to be able to shift roles. And also enough sense of theory of mind in order to be able to shift, move roles and enough idea about what you're interested in. So if you do something a bit unexpected, am I gonna get cross and shout at you or go off in a huff or throw my, you know, toys out of my pram, or am I going to go with it? Oh, that's interesting. Let's go with that. And of course, that all comes from somebody being interested in you initially and being curious and being interested and finding interest in the world. So, mm -hmm. wow, look at that amazing sunset, or isn't that a beautiful thing? Or look at that flower. So those things give rise to this kind of openness to life, I think, mm -hmm. which is what we want in our kids. Mm -hmm. And we can link this, if you'd like, to... Um, if, you, if it's in one of the questions, to how we think about this with schools and teachers and those sorts of people. But actually, that's how real learning takes place. Mm. So one of the things that really strikes me, and I'm probably jumping well ahead now, Becky, with your questions, but <laughs> it's how the current environment that we're living in is affecting people's ability to engage with all those kind of methods of all those, you know, wonder and playing with people and empathising and reading thoughts and, and behaviours. I mean, it's it must be really difficult for particularly very young kids at the moment. I think you're right. Does that link with one of your questions, Becky? Probably does comment? later, but I just, yeah, it just springs to mind with everything that you're yeah, saying. Yeah, but do, no, no, if it doesn't matter, we can, yeah, we can jump, we can jump to that, absolutely. You can go with the yeah. flow. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah. that's what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, <be> um, <laughs> so I think we're living increasingly in a world which overvalues results, mm. which overvalues things like testing that overvalues producing things that other people think you ought to be producing or producing things that you think other people think you ought to be producing mm -hmm. and one thing that does is produce anxiety anyway but the other it is it produces a sense of um i can't quite be myself because i need to be how i think you think i ought to be and whether that's in social media or whether that's in being a compliant child with a particular kind of parent, or whether that's in 
trying to produce the right kind of answer in the right kind of way for my teacher, or indeed whether that includes being the kind of teacher who has to um, please Ofsted and the, you know, the national curriculum and all the expectations around that and learning plans and all the rest of it. What that means is that actually you're out of the moment mm. you know, because you're all the time trying to be what you think somebody, somebody else thinks ought, you ought to be, or you're trying to get the kid to be something that the national curriculum or mm. your, your, you know, your SATs um, expectations and predictions or whatever it is are trying to get you to be. And I think what that does generate is anxiety. It generates mm. a kind of rigidity but also it kills off curiosity because if you're not interested in what I'm interested in, what happens to my interest in the world, which we're all born with? Mm. You know, it, uh, of course, it only comes online when we feel safe enough, but it, we're all born with this capacity to be interested. And so I, I think that the education system in the UK and in a lot of, we lot of Western countries increasingly, well, it's got a lot to answer for really. If we compare it to, for example, the education system in countries like Finland that have stunningly good results. They, they don't even start formal education until they're about seven. Mm. They don't have as formal a national curriculum as us. A lot of their early years work stuff is all about play, almost nothing else, but they do have an idea about play, which may be linked with some of the kind of slight um, psychology theory, which maybe isn't taught as much anymore, like Vygotsky and those kinds of ideas to do with them, even Piaget, the ideas of the idea that you work with the zone of proximal development. So I'm not going to give you really complex toys if you're struggling, but I might try and put something in front of you that's going to challenge you a bit if you get interested in it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like it's just free play. It's like you're pro providing learning opportunities. And this is like the old school, um, the old school um, kind of person-centered learning, if you like, which was, <clears throat> which was a very prominent idea in the 70s and 80s and, got, and has got lost a bit. And what you want is kids who are really fascinated by, and it's interesting, I've seen this most and most playfully in um, kids who have been homeschooled, interestingly, and they quite often will just go off on a track because they get interested in the subject. And it might be Elizabethan England, it might be a particular kind of military exercise, it might be whatever it is, but they will look up, look at um, umpteen YouTube videos, the parents get worried, they get a bit obsessed with this, but actually they come out of it, the other end, with deep knowledge, but also the ability to explore, to find out for themselves, to follow their interests, and, and the yeah. parents who've helped in, the, in these sorts of ways are often the ones who say, oh yeah, well let's go and, I don't know, yeah. go to a museum that does that kind of thing. Or, a bit more self-driven. Exactly, absolutely, because the life that we want to live has to be one in which we feel a bit true to ourselves, otherwise mm. there is, otherwise what, what, what is it? So play is at the root of that. And one of the things I find particularly shocking is that A, that gets knocked out of teachers who are less playful than maybe they could be because of the anxiety and, having, and the form filling and all that sort of stuff. Um, but also then the kids forget how to, that this is a good thing. And if you're in an age of helicopter parenting and doing Kumon mass one day and gym the next day and violin lessons the next day, and these kids never have a chance to bloody well, excuse my language guys, they don't have a chance to be big, to get bored. They don't have a chance just to kind of loll about and, and mope about a bit. And that's where actually creativity comes from. Mm. it comes from being bored and I think every parent these days is incredibly anxious and so they can't and it's all done from very good motives you want the best for your kids but mm. actually often backfires because these kids don't have a chance just to be no I'm very guilty of that with my kids I must admit we've done everything you know we try everything we try everything we find something you enjoy yeah. and actually at the end of the day they're not interested in doing those things or well, they don't know what they're interested in. That's the thing. If you, yeah. I mean, if you find that they're interested in something, then support them. That's that's mm. a whole whole other thing. But mm. if you watch a child play, they don't know what they're going to do next. Mm. No. That's the whole point of it, really. I mean, there are set there are things called play, which are have got very set rules. Where you know, 
chess and things like that. But that's not quite what we're talking about today. We're talking about creative and imaginative play in which they're working things out, they're working things through. And it's not just about learning, of course, because one of the really important things about play and one of the things that we learn therapeutically day in, day out is that it's through play that things get worked out unconsciously. And you will see time and time again, you ask a kid a question, are you happy? What was it like? Like, And they haven't got an answer and they just feel put on the spot. Give them a bunch of toy animals and toy people and you get the answer through, um, I don't know, fights taking place or a child being sad or sometimes you get really difficult things. Of course, kids will work through the most complex innermost um, anxieties, fears or experiences through the process of play in, in a way in which they almost never could verbally, which is partly why people, I think, I think it was Melanie Klein, suggested that play was the equivalent of free association in children and how why we use play as such an important medium in therapeutic work. And of course, you get kids who, I, mean, I think it's one of the things that, that's a real problem with, um, there's, there's been a real stressor in COVID, of course, is that, is that kids haven't got to have the opportunity to play with other kids nearly so much. But it's mm-hmm. also that we, if you, well, I, I'm, I'm in danger of veering off a bit, but I think teachers and schools really need to know that they need to leave space for kids to be able to express what's going on inside them. And they won't be able to do that through trying to get them to catch up with their curriculum immediately. Yeah. yeah. This is what I keep, when I listen to it, I keep coming back to the thought that we need space to be able to play, whether that's that's yeah. actual space that's created for us as in time or whether it's internal space and not being too busy in our minds, not having too much to do or not being flooded with anxiety. And it just makes me think about a lot of the children that I work with and, you know, it is so curriculum driven at school and their curiosity is stumped because they're scared to fail. And, you know, yeah. they might actually really struggle with the academic side of work and then they don't even want to do it because, and that's play, having a go at it and risking going wrong and, and actually having an opportunity to have another turn. And they're too scared to do that. Exactly. Because it might not go right. Exactly. So we see that much more, of course, in kids who've had more complex lives. They might not have been in poverty mm-hmm. or, but they might have been. They might be much more stressed in that yeah. home. But... And of course, it goes back to some of the research that Carol Dweck and people talked about, which we, we, which is that you don't want to praise a kid for their for, for I don't know, being very clever because they'll stop trying. You want to praise them for the effort they've made or mm. how hard you know, that 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 kind of thing. But if you're less confident, you'll become less rigid and you'll you'll try less, and that actually it becomes such a double, treble, quadruple whammy because it's the kids who try and fail and fall over and make a mistake that they're the ones who are going to be doing the learning. Mm-hmm. And it used to be in the old days, in certain, certainly psychoanalytic theory, seen as a kind of defensive process to be a bit omnipotent. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, but what the play research shown really clearly is that if you give a bunch of kids a really complex task to do, and you say, I don't know, like take a, a take apart a toaster and put it back together again, it's amazing how many kids will say they can do it. And one of the really fascinating things, and it just comes to straight to your point, Becky, is that the kids who were most omnipotent, because they were, um, and they were the ones who, even though it all went wrong, they would continue to try and try and try. Mm. So in a way, what we want in kids is a, is a, is a, is a, is a kind of omnipotence that in adults we would think as, of as unhealthy. But what you don't want is too much realism. Strangely, and I think psychoanalytic therapy particularly has got a lot to learn from this, which is that if you're too realistic as a child, well, I know I can't do that because that's a bit too complicated, then you're more likely to be depressed, interestingly, mm-hmm. as a child. So what we want is kind of pleasure, creativity, um, a bit of omnipotence, a bit of belief in yourself. And that also, it's a sign of, but also builds resilience, of course, because it's through, and what we know, of course, yeah. is through through research on parent-infant work and other work with people like Etronic, is that it's through mismatches and repairs that resilience grows. It's not through having a perfect relationship. It's not through having a perfectly attuned mother or therapist. It's through having one who knows how to help a, a repair a mismatch, which happens all the time in life. 
And if you're scared of that, or if you're too rigid to keep trying, then you won't grow and you won't develop. So it's what in, 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 in the sports world or the kind of nutrition, many people in the health world, alternative health world, there are people talking about as a hormetic response. In other words, we need to have a degree of stress in order to grow and develop, whether that's in the gym or psychologically or whatever. And if you stop trying, then you, you, you're not allowing yourself to, you know, where you, you, don't, you don't believe in your being that you can manage the level of stress needed for the next stage of growth. If that makes sense. Yeah. That's good. Great. Yeah. Anna, do you have any questions on that? I'm just, the, the next question we've got, Graham, was actually about thinking about how therapists, you know, we can, we can struggle as creative arts therapists in schools and trying to promote this space that is creative and helping um, teachers and schools to value that specific play space. And I'm thinking about that, but then I'm also thinking about how we also support schools to value play in school and not just in the therapy room and I'm, I'm sort of thinking that it doesn't even necessarily have to be you know we have play time but it's how we help teachers to foster being playful and making space where children can fail and and try again and I'm just wondering how you define the value of this or how, how you could maybe maybe um, you don't do the experience specifically in schools but how you think that we could as therapists in school help a skeptical teacher or head teacher really understand the value of this work it's subtle work in schools i think because especially as a therapist because often you're seen as a kind of luxury extra that and and it's all right for you because you've got all this time with the kid and i've got 33 of them and so you i think we have to be very subtle in the way we talk about these things. I do find a bit of subtle psychoeducation with teachers, often best done by the kettle at, or in the staff room as opposed to in a formal inset one, can, be, can go a long way in which you also include some of the research findings. Mm. I, mm. I find that really, really useful, but also quoting back some of the things. So you know, I saw Sharon in the room today or whatever the young kids are really called Sharon these days. But anyway, it's um, um <laughs> and in her play, she was she showed quite clearly that all the child, all the all the child, all the children in that play in the, with her five folk were really frightened of scary loud voices, and I could feel her terror in the room, and I just wondered. That, you know, I, I know that you think she doesn't concentrate when, and sometimes you might want to shout a bit more loudly in the classroom, but I think she might be the kind of child who freezes a bit. So do you know about the freeze response? And that, so this is, a, so I would use exa as many examples as I can from play to try to educate about the, what you can, extraordinary things you can find out from play that you can't find out in any other way. And, I would also use observation in classrooms where I could, if, that, if we got space and time to do that sort of thing. And I think actually they, it's tricky because teachers are under so much pressure and the pressure of course, is what gives rise to what we don't wanna see, which mm -hmm. is more anxiety, which is more being more driven, um, to making more demands. Because either, either they feel a failure or they feel the kids aren't delivering and they get angry with the kids or and none of those things are going to be very, very helpful. So I think some of the science around play, but also the science around emotional is linked, really. I think the science around play is it can be linked to the science around emotional understanding and learning. And so the fact that so even at a very good starting point is that you, it's very hard to learn if you're tense or you're fearful or if you don't feel confident that somebody likes you. And so if you can get even those basic ideas, sort of empathy, neurobiology, polyvagal theory 101, if you like, if you can get any of those very basic ideas into classrooms and school cultures, I think it goes a long, long way. And also I, just, I think sometimes because teachers are so kind of in the role and with their expectations, they don't realize the effects that they're having on some of the kids and especially the more vulnerable ones. And I particularly worry about the more 
I don't know, the quieter ones sitting in the back of the classroom who probably wouldn't get, even get referred to pay therapy because they're not causing a fuss. And, and they're the ones that really need help in being understood, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you can also do these things through school insets and yeah. having the confidence that I think the danger is that as therapists of any denomination, it's easy to feel that you're a bit of a nuisance in people's busy days or that you're a dustbin for bad kids who are a problem. And having the confidence, which comes from, I don't know how long play therapy training can be, but I think they're at least three or four three years, aren't they? You know, often they're often master's levels or not always, but um, but either way, you no one is doing this job without a high level of experience, expertise, knowledge and understanding. And it's important that you feel that and take some authority when you go into schools, alongside being mm. incredibly respectful of what they're all up to as well. Mm. Yeah, and it, it, it's really challenging. It? I think particularly, I've got quite a few friends who are year six teachers and they're always bringing me to offload actually because they have such a they've got so many pressures and right now all they want is to give the children space they don't want to think about doing yeah. any exams this year they just want them to come back and they just want them to settle and the schools are telling them that they have to do exams and and check out where they are right now so you know they've got the pressure of maybe wanting to be playful but the system tells them that they have to be a certain way which you know it is a really big challenge it's, it's a, a real it's problem so yeah and i think it needs changing isn't it it really does especially and i think a lot you know some kids have had a fantastic time over covid they've had both parents and they've been able to be with them and it's been brilliant yeah i suspect yeah. they're in a minority and a lot of kids have been um they've seen their parents lose their jobs they've seen them fight their these parents are absolutely at their wits end they do not know how to do home education why should they they don't know how to be with themselves, let alone their kids. And they're coming back actually traumatised. Mm. A lot of kids are coming back traumatised. And that's without the ones that are witnessing domestic violence or, or experiencing abuse or physical chastisement or all kinds of different things like that. Mm. And I would try to quote some of the science. Now, creativity isn't everything. Um, but doggedness and what they call grit is quite important as well so i think if you take two things one is that actually learning and persistence takes place through developing resilience which takes place through trial and error and that what we know for example is i don't know that the ability to defer gratification marshmallow test or whatever is one of the best predictors of outcomes of every of everything a miles better predictor of school grade outcome is the capacity to defer gratification and emotional regulation is much better than IQ as a predictor. And, and they need to know that. So that comes through being helped to try and be experimental, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing is creative thought, which is part of this, but it's the other side of the coin and we need both sides. It's only enhanced. It's not, it's not enhanced by trying too hard. It's enhanced by what I said before, boredom. And they did these great experiments years ago where they got people to do things that um, you can't do now because phone books don't exist. But they gave people three tasks to do. One included, one including reading from or actually writing out the phone book. And then afterwards, the other people could do sort of interesting things. And then afterwards, they gave people creative tasks to do, come up with word associations. The ones who were most successful were the ones who had to copy out the blooming phone book. Now, I'm not suggesting, I'm quite definitely not suggesting you copy out the phone, but what, there's something about when you're doing those kinds of boredom is actually gives rise to creativity. Mm. Now, Newton didn't try and invent the theory of gra gravity, an apple fell on his head or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's those, those sorts of things. Then you make the links. If you're alive enough to potential, you make the links mm. yourself. Mm. And uh, so I, I think really central to learning is both sides of these coins, which is how to develop a safeness to, so that you can keep trying and develop resilience and effortfulness in a way which isn't too effortful. You know, I, I'm interested in this because I'm interested in it, not because you tell me to, to do it, and otherwise I'm going to get punished. And also the ability to be creative and imaginative. And there are whole parts of the brain, and I think it's always useful to use the brain when you're talking to teachers, there's whole parts of the brain that only turn on when you stop trying. 
the, the, these systems you probably know about called the default mode network, they all fire up like crazy when you stop trying. And they turn off when you start trying. So there's intentional networks and there's a salience network. But what we want is, it's the default mode network that gives rise to creativity. Because all these networks are working unconsciously when you're not, when you stop trying. The other bit of the brain stuff, well, we're on to the brain, is the stuff to do with the prefrontal cortex and the fear system and those sorts of things. And I think they're rather, in a way that I, I tend to use them as metaphors. That's not really exactly how the brain works. But what teachers need to know is you can't learn when you're scared. You can't learn when you're fearful. You can't think, you know, uh, you're not supposed to have either empathy or complex cognitive skills when somebody's about to beat you up or eat you. So that is not what we've evolved. We've evolved when we're stressed and in danger to just survive. Mm. And survive means being vigilant, jumpy, tense. It means those more, those parts of the brain like it, like the prefrontal cortex are essentially involved in cognition. They're not that important in those moments. And so we mm. have to emphasize and emphasize and re-emphasize the importance of feeling safe. Mm. Mm. See some lovely um, visuals that we could create from that, um, Becky. Some really nice kind of almost flow charts and mm. you know nice images that we could share. Yeah, yeah, and and absolutely, like you know, children can't be safe and if they don't feel safe enough to learn, they're not going to be able to. And likewise with play, you know, if they don't feel safe and if they don't feel soothed, they're not going to be curious enough curious enough to play exactly. and as someone who is also very interested in play I'd love to hear Graham sort of any tips that you have or any um things that you think are really supportive to an adult child relationship so let's think of the therapeutic relationship for the therapist to really support a child who's struggling to engage in play and to help them feel soothed enough to do so okay well the thing is, there's so many different kinds of kids and they'll all present with different impediments to their ability to play. But what I would say with all of this, whether as a parent or a friend or a social worker or a teacher or a play therapist, is the first job is to regulate ourselves and to try to be aware of what's going on in us in the presence of the child. So yeah. Because if I'm tense and I think they ought to be playing and my play therapy supervisor is watching me, I've got to write notes for my supervision session, I'm not going to be able to play. So, so we have to work out what's going on in us in a particular moment. And often that might be very simple things like breathing a bit more deeply or trying to relax our tense muscles a bit more, those, those sorts of things. Then linked with that, I think, certainly with the more traumatized kids who are more rigid and reactive and might kick off at any moment, I think it has to be finding a way of helping them come much more into what trauma people have been talking about for the last few years as the window of tolerance, that, that calmness, that ease, that mm -hmm. sense of, so in a way that it's a kind of down-regulating with them. And only from there will they be able to play. So until they can feel calm enough, they won't be able to play. Until they feel safe enough, they won't be able to play. And you know, anxiety kills off playful, absolutely kills it off in a nanosecond. And again, the research, bears this out very clearly. The other bit about working with the more traumatized, overtly traumatized, say abuse, some of the abused kids, is that you, you have to watch very carefully for the difference between, if they can do imaginary play, sometimes it can get pretty nasty. And what you have to do, sometimes they need to enact quite nasty, dangerous mm. things. But sometimes they'll be doing things which will trigger PTSD types of symptoms in them. So you just have to be quite watchful of that. I'm not quite answering your questions, but I, I sort of am because I think it's playful and um, safeness has to be the bottom line. I think with some of the kids who are more rigid, maybe come from backgrounds of high level of neglect. I work with quite a lot of those kids from um, adopted from from horrifying orphanages many years ago, and work with many many adopted kids from ne neglectful backgrounds. Often their needs are a bit different to the traumatized kids because, mm -hmm. in a way, in them you need to spark a bit of life. So the, mm. some of the other kids need down-regulating, these kids need up-regulating a bit. And in that, then it's looking for little moments where you see a little bit of, a little bit of life. And it could be in the way they move their hands or their leg, legs are, you know, their toes are jiggling a bit, those sorts of things. And you can make those things into games 
And one of the challenges with those kinds of kids is often they're a bit sort of flat and dead in themselves. And in their presence, you can go a bit flat and dead in yourself, but you don't want to tell your boss or your supervisor. But actually, that's how you feel. And that's often the biggest yeah. clue to what, what these kids need. And so they need enlivening and they need our capacity to try to remain alive enough to be playful with them. And it's in these little nano moments. The, the template I, I often use is one that came from the work of a very famous child psychiatrist, psychoanalyst called Selma Freiberg, which you may or may not have come across. And in the 60s, she did a lot of very interesting work. One bit of work was with blind babies and sighted mothers. And she found that the mothers often wanted to give up on these babies who would then retreat into their own world and they'd, they'd end up looking quite like kids on the spectrum, actually. And she found that if she helped these mothers see the kids, you know, he's not actually looking in your eyes because he can't see. But did you see that when you said his name like that, his little toe would move and his little fingers would move and the mums would get more interested and they would interact more and the babies would interact more. And it's spotting this little tiny developmentally um, growth 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 inducing potentially growth inducing moments that we can use in play and it might be so one of the problems with all kinds of both i think both um psychoanalytic psychotherapy but also non-directive play therapy is that we can be too non-directive and actually mm -hmm. we have to use ourselves a bit more with these kinds of kids that we have to maybe start a game or make something into a game if an autistic kid is going is flapping in their own world, you might need to get in front of them and flap back and try to make it into a bit of a game. If they're spinning around and picking, you know, so all the, you, you, you make things a bit more reciprocal. Even those dreadful games of endless football that you end up playing in play therapy sometimes can be, can be made <laughs> into a bit more fun, I think. Yeah, yeah. And because they're reciprocal, and you could, am I throwing it? Am I not throwing it? Because you're learning, first of all, you're learning turn taking you're learning um, prediction or not. You know, you don't, do you know if I'm gonna throw it or not, where I'm gonna throw it? All of these things are being learned. You're learning to be appreciated. You're learning that somebody's interested in you. A whole range of different things mm. can come out of these games. And also yeah. I think, in, in, you know, often these kids, are, some of these kids are very, have got very little ability for imaginative play for a long, long time. And we sometimes have to do it with them. And I would take the toys out sometimes and so, Sharon, who nobody's called Sharon anymore, might take out a horse and I might say, or I might take a horse and say, and I might talk from the horse instead of talking, for, and, and then to see if um, there's a response. And they might just look for a bit. And, but eventually they will join in if we do, if we do it in such a way that it's, it, it's this Vygotsky thing of the zone of proximal development. Oh, maybe I could try that. And they often do. Yeah, I think um, this is all quite confirming for therapists as well to hear that, you know, that we all have these similar experiences and actually it's really helpful for us to check in with ourselves and not let our anxieties get in the way of how that child is ready to present. Exactly, yeah. And, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. in psychiatry like therapy, we're always, you know, you've got kind of what we'd call a sort of a supervisory super ego on our shoulders that always saying well, you must make the right transference interpretation and with you guys it's probably much more to do with getting the kid to play in the right sort of way but actually there's no right or wrong about any, any of these things and i think trusting our own gut, gut and being a bit intuitive within bounds and being playful which me means being kind of energized in ourselves as well is the root of the kind of form of therapeutic play which is healing and growth inducing I think mm. the bit I want to put in here as well is to do with physicality. And of course, you know, we concentrate a lot on imaginative play, symbolic play, those sorts of things that's so profoundly important. I found out things from kids that I never knew that they were thinking or feeling through how they played symbolically. Maybe we've already hinted at that, but maybe we can come back to that. But actually, we are mammals, and all mammals invest a lot of energy in play evolution wouldn't have allowed that to happen unless it was for very good reasons and animals that don't play whether it's rats or chimpanzees or dogs they don't have such good lives and the play in their terms is it's a kind of pretend so a dog would have a play face or before they start the play and but often it's quite aggressive play often it might be play fighting rough and tumble rough housing, those, those sorts of things. And they get a bit of a bad press in 
today's classroom environment and also with parents. And I think it's particularly tough in primary schools because it's more boys than girls, whether that's biological or cultural, we can argue, but it's more boys than girls that have got more energy to expend. Maybe we're less developed as boys as well, but not able to concentrate so well, who knows, but it's, um, and they need that rough and tumble. There's not enough male teachers and there's not enough acknowledgement of how important that sort of stuff is. I don't think boys should be able to take over playgrounds just to play football and leave the girls in the corner. But thankfully more girls are playing now as well. But it's, but it's about the physicality. The, 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 the animals that play fight are the ones that become successful. You know, they get mm -hmm. mates, they, um, all of that sort of stuff. So we can't underestimate that, even older kids. So one of the interesting things, this conversations I had many years ago was with the head teacher of Eton. I don't know why, I think, I think I was doing a training event that happened to be on their premises at the weekend and he was there. And he said, well, look, the thing is, if we don't get these boys out in the playing fields every afternoon, they don't do any learning in the afternoon. They're just playing games. I mean, football or rugby, or whatever, but they're playing games. And it's the physicality which gives rise to the capacity to learn. And one of the bits of really fascinating, important science that's come out in the last 15, 20 years, I think, is actually what does help the brain develop and grow? So there's this thing called neurogenesis, which is the growth of new neurons in the brain. And they found that you, it is possible, despite people's doubts originally, that new brain cells can grow in crucial parts of the brain, particularly in the hippocampus, which is central to memory. But what gives rise to neurogenesis in the hippocampus is not doing Sudoku or, or, or extra homework, it's physical exercise. Mm -hmm. So we need to take that bit seriously as well. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I'm a massive fan, huge fan of any form of, I'm a drama and movement therapist. And oh, that's great, yeah. The rough and tumble element and sword fighting and you know, we've had to overcome lots with COVID. We've done lots of um, pretend air fighting to drum beats just to really get that energy oh, out of brilliant. because we yeah. can't use anything. Else. Yeah, but we found we found ways to overcome. And I think that's something that I've really taken actually from coronavirus is actually quite how resilient some of these children, that yeah. how they can show us their resilience through their play and how they can show us how they can adapt when, you know, we have to say, okay, we're not allowed to do that anymore. What can we do instead? And they're coming up with these fantastic playful ideas. So credit to them to you know to be able to do that and to the therapist for making that space that sounds um, brilliant Becky and it's a, yeah I'm very impressed yeah. by that and I have seen it even even it because there's no, it's not the same I wish I was doing this in real life with you guys and it will be different and I'd you know we'd be aware of our whole bodies and we were at the movement and you don't know what I'm doing I might be fiddling my I might be doing all kinds of things with my feet and goodness knows what which give really important clues about where the other person is I was seeing a patient, the other day, adult patient actually the other day, who always would jiggle his legs when he was anxious to have a very still top front, you know, um, top. And I had to say to him, look, I don't know what you're feeling because I can't see your legs moving. But I but, and mm. had to try to get him to, to do that. So I think the real problems with, with, with this kind of interaction on screens, and it's very two dimensional as well, but you can do amazing things, as you said. And even using the chat button function and the drawing functions and those sorts of things can be incredible. So, yeah, yeah but it, it is a challenge and there is something to be said for resilience. But also, I do think some kids have really struggled. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I think it that highlights that we have to keep adapting and finding ways to do the work, even if it's not quite the same as we'd hope it would usually be. Yeah. 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 Um, Graham, I'm not aware of time. I think we've we've mm. taken as much time of yours as we'd agreed to. Um, I don't mind a couple. We've... Let's let's do a few more minutes and enjoy it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, amazing. I, I mean, I think we could um, talk to you for ages. There's lots and lots to learn from you. Um, yeah, I mean, you you had something that you said you were going to go back to just before Graham. Do you know what that was? Did I? Did you note that, Anna? I was too busy listening. Well, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned, if I may, I'm going to just jump in and ask, because you, you alluded to, you know, a playfulness and animals. And I, I had a question about nature versus nurture. I mean, is it very much the play, would you say, is something that is in our nature? Or is it something? Yeah, you know? I think it is. I think it's an evolved mechanism in all mammals. 
So I think we, we evolved to be playful. There are very few cultures. I don't know if you, so in my book, Nurturing Natures, which is really kind of a child development primer in a way, I tried to put aspects about culture in every, every chapter. And when I was researching about play, I didn't find, so some cultures value play a bit more than others. But there's no cultures that I found where, where children don't play. And nearly always play is part of learning. Mm -hmm. so the play fighting, when I was in, when I was, um, I was lucky enough to do a trip to South Africa for work and I, um, a few years back, and I remember it being in the um, bush, which is the highlight, one of the highlights of my life. And I remember seeing these giraffes doing play fighting neck to neck, or you see kind of yeah. mm -hmm. animals doing play fighting. That will allow them to hone the skills needed to survive in their later environment. And I think it's entirely innate. And what they found with, in fact, the research with monkeys found that monkeys deprived of play opportunities. They didn't function in whatever the primate society was that they were due to grow up to become part of. So I think it's utterly innate. It's a huge investment of energy, calories and resources in evolutionary terms to spend all this time playing and it doesn't happen for no reason. And, and it is part of learning how to be in the world. It's part of the adaptive brain in a way. So the kids in certain hunter-gatherer communities will learn how to, um, they'll be playing with pretend spears and they'll be playing with pretend pounding because that's what they need to survive in their culture. So it, it's, it's, I see it as growth inducing in its own right, but also in where you get things from play, but you don't do it to get anything from it, mm. if you like. And that's one of the wonderful paradoxes of play. Mm, I like that. Yeah, it's making me think as well of risk. Like there's so many, we, we can, I mean, particularly in physical play, we can take so many risks that are safe risks to take. Obviously we could potentially cause some physical harm if we're taking too big a risks, but it allows so much space for us to try things and for it to go wrong. and that benefit that we get from that is so important that it looks like maybe they're not doing anything that's beneficial actually they're gaining so much from it oh god uh, and certainly my own childhood i was quite an inhibited shy scared kid who couldn't say boo to acoustic boo to acoustic the idea that i would be able to speak to hundreds of people at conferences and stuff i never dreamt i'd be able to and so i suppose it's a sign that some change can take place later on in life but um mm. But, and I longed for that, you know, somebody to help me do those things that I was too scared to do, the jumping and leaping and, or the kind of things that you do. I wish you'd be my drum therapist play that when I was young and, and it helped me, and yeah, helped me trust to do make-believe games and take on roles and all that, that sort of thing. And it's so, so vital, so crucial for health and development at every single level, I think. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And it's also true in adult life. So if you can't, so Winnicott said, actually about psychotherapy, he said that there's, um, that if the, the first job of therapy, and he was talking about adult psychoanalysis, is to how central play is. And if a patient can't play, then our job is to help bring them to the point where they can play. This is adults in psychoanalysis. For him, creativity, yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely central to living a life that's got any kind of richness and depth to it mm, yeah absolutely and it, it's integral in us just being successful as adults as well we have to find places to you know we take risks every day in our work and in the things that we do and that's how we have to learn to do it so it's super important as adults right that we're having a level of play in our in our lives as well and making space to to get bored and to to play and and have space to be creative I completely agree. And just going back to the risk thing, which is not quite what you're saying, but actually we live in such a risk averse culture mm -hmm. yeah. that the kids haven't got the freedom to do the exploration that they probably need. And whether that's leaping and jumping from rocks or jumping into ponds or... Certainly when I was a kid, it was like, well, okay. Um, so you've had your breakfast, here's a packed lunch, see you at tea time. And that was it really. There wasn't massive mm. amounts of parental supervision. There probably should have been more, but mm. there was an idea that actually there wasn't. Everyone wasn't worried all the time that that something really bad was going to happen around the corner. I think even 
even sort of play centers for kids designed for kids with with or without disabilities they're so risk averse and they're so unimaginative we have to yeah. find more imagination and and give kids give kids a bit a bit more trust really yeah it's back to carol dweck's work again isn't it and yeah you know we take the risks we've got to be okay with failing and not see it as a failure see it as a setback and that exactly. all comes through play exactly all comes through play and if you're a teacher or a headmaster and you're so worried about health and safety because you're worried about being sued that you don't allow kids to do i don't know monkey bars whatever it is then what a loss mm. Becky, yeah. did you want to ask her? I mean, they're not even allowed to run. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, pardon, Anna. Sorry, did you want to ask Graham? Before I know we're running out of time. I didn't know if you wanted to ask Graham about his assessment tool. If that's not going into too much detail at this late stage, we were keen to just question anything about sort of how you assess in therapy, Graham, with children, and, and actually if you use play as your tool for assessment. Yes, primarily if the kids are young enough. I mean, you get kids when they hit the cusp of secondary school and they don't want to play anymore, take those stupid childish toys away. And But nonetheless, in principle, yes. And two things, one is just through informal watching what how a child plays and the content of their play. And that could be anything from play in which quite clearly there's no generational distinction between the children, the child dolls and the adult dolls. And you'd be worrying, worrying about why that's the case. And do they not have a sense that parents and adults can look after them? To if they play, if they got, if there's wild, we always have wild animals and domestic animals in our toy boxes. And if they're all jumbled up and fighting each other, then that's not a good sign. Whereas if there's some distinction, if there's some fencing used, for example, that would be a good sign. So there'll be all kinds of little clues and cues that you'd watch. And I'm also great. I'm also a fan of story stem as a way of doing formal assessment. But although I did train in it, I've never managed. I did a third time, having failed, pass the, um, the, pass the test to score it. Only the psychologists and psychiatrists seem to pass that one when I did it at Tavistock. But I, can, I still use the protocol because it's just so fascinating what comes out. So people, for people who don't know the story stem protocol, you start a story and then you say, and then what happens next? And you allow the kid to develop the story and you get such different responses depending on where the kid comes from so i'll just give you one very so i think the first one is we've got a bunch of animals including a family of little pig, piggies and then the little piggy goes past the cow past the horsey past the whatever animals you get and then past the crocodile past the lion past the and then oh here i am on my own over here what happens next and of course the securely attached kids Immediately, the parents are saying, where's, the, where's my little darling? And in no time at all, they've cuddled and made, made up. Whereas the avoidant kids just kept, go off on their own and there's no mm -hmm. such thing as an adult who will think about them. Mm -hmm. And those who come from backgrounds of trauma, you see all kinds of things like violence, abuse, they get eaten, come alive, and all kinds of things like that. So these are fantastic tools and help us understand so much. Yeah, I think it's um, so helpful for us as therapists to have you know, play is our, our form of communication when we're working with children. So it's really helpful to have tools that are playful um, as assessment methods, Absolutely. as opposed to tick box. Um, tick boxes don't work. And whatnot. I don't think they work. No, and they also don't allow the child's voice to run through. We're not even asking the child those questions. They're asked about them to other adults. Yeah, So true. that play actually true. helps us to talk about them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. So... Graham, let's end on something playful. Um, how do you include play in your daily life? Do you have a favourite game that you enjoy? <laughs> I'm not a great... Interestingly, I did see that you are going to ask this and I didn't really... And I, I ignored it. And I think it's because <laughs> I'm not a great... I'm not... I like being playful in most things I'm doing, but I don't... Like, I'm not a great lover of formal games. I'll join mm -hmm. in Shiraz at Christmas and those sorts of things. And, you know, I... I so, I used to play a lot of football when I was young and I loved dancing and in any of those things I'd want to do something a little bit unusual. I'd like to be playful and find a new move or find a, a new way of, way of doing things and when I'm with my friends some one of my biggest joys well I hope will come back any, any day now is to, is to is to have a slightly left field sense of humor with your mates and 
say interesting fun things and a lot of it is with movement with kids as well of course and in therapy I just I think if you can't be playful what play does it allows you to step outside of something into a new space it's creating mm -hmm. something new and exciting in my work you know I actually think this is probably ter sounds terribly sad to most ordinary human beings who um, have got proper lives but actually I'm completely engrossed in the in thinking and researching and understanding this work and I always like finding a new angle and when I find a new theory I feel excited and I try to put it together with the old theories and uh, and I it's made me actually a bit unpopular in some circles because people want the theory they've been taught and you know they want you to be making transference interpretations or whatever it is that they want you to do and if you're not you can be seen as disloyal and I could probably do with a bit more rigidity but actually, it's so exciting. You know, we're living at a, in a time, I wish I was 30 years younger, we're living in a time where there's so much interesting stuff going through. Mm -hmm. And I feel hungry for it. Melanie Klein talked in a very ugly way about having an episty, epistemophilic instinct, horrible term. But what, it, what she means is that we're born with a hunger for learning. And for me, creativity is in finding new things, not knowing quite what I'm going to find, and finding a use for it or finding a way of matching it with something else mm -hmm. so it's not really answered your questions but i think the idea is to be playful in whatever we do mm -hmm. that yeah, my, that's my and that's a lovely way to end because actually it highlights that we don't have to play physical games to be playing and that play can just emerge in yeah. anything that you're doing i think the best forms do don't they it's like that, that spontaneous joke that thing that you never thought was going to come into your head and the best creativity is like that you can't try and write a novel or a poem or a song, they just kind of, it's like they float by and occasionally you grab one, uh, is how I see it. So yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, that's love great. Love it. <laughs> Brilliant. And it's so wonderful that you've got a job that you love because that's, you know, that gives you the inspiration, doesn't it, to carry on and find out new stuff. Yeah. But, and it often takes, takes courage, doesn't it, to kind of dare to go into a profession which probably is not very well paid and your parents don't think it's a good idea and all of that sort of thing. But yeah. if you can, so you, in a way, I suppose certainly for me, it was like finding the courage to make that move and, and trusting that there was something that I'd find and be able to be any good at, at the other end instead of mm. my usual fear. Wonderful. Thank you so much for answering all of our many questions. Uh, it's really, yeah. really lovely to see you again. And I'm sure we could just go on for hours, but we will respect our hour that we uh, <laughs> booked with you. Okay. So thank you so much. We will sign off. And Becky, thank you very much. Do you want to stop recording?